Well, good morning and welcome to the sixth meeting of the Justice Committee in 2018. We have apologies from Fulton McGregor. Agenda item number one is the decision on taking item five in private, which is consideration of our forward work programme. Are we all agreed? Agreed. Thank you. Agenda item two is around table evidence session on Brexit and policing and criminal justice. The purpose of the, the round table is to explore issues around policing and criminal justice in Scotland in light of the UK's planned departure from the European Union. And it's my pleasure to welcome all the witnesses today. And I suggest that we, we start the round table by just going round introducing ourselves, everyone round the round table. I'm Margaret Mitchell, convener of the Justice Committee. Yeah, Gail Scott, one of the clerks to the committee. Diane Barr, one of the clerks to the committee. DCI Lorraine Henderson, Police Scotland. Good morning, Ben McPherson, MSP for Edinburgh, Northern and Leith. Morning everyone, my name is Michael Clancy, I'm the Director of Law Reform at the Law Society of Scotland. Good morning, Matt and Barr, John Finney, MSP, Highlands and Islands. Good morning, I'm Claire Connolly, I'm representing the Faculty of Advocates. Good morning, I'm Liam McArthur, I'm the MSP for Orkney. Good morning, I'm Helen Nisbet, Head of International Cooperation at Crown Office. Representing the North East region. Maurice Curry, MSP for the West Scotland region. Leandro Mancano, lecturer in EU law at the, at the Umbrella Law School. Mary Goujon, I'm the MSP for Angus North and Mearns. George Adam, I'm Paisley's MSP. Uh, Dr Philip Glover, uh, University of Aberdeen. Uh, Daniel Johnson, uh, MSP for Edinburgh Southern. Laura Mackay, MSP for Strathkelvin and Bearstein and Deputy Convener of the Committee. Thank you all very much for that. The idea of the roundtable is to um, encourage a more free exchange with each other that you know you probably wouldn't get if we had a panel. And it's still, although it's more informal in setting, very much on the record. Um, and probably you don't need to touch your microphone. Those of you who have been here before will know that if you indicate you want to speak, I call your name, then um, your microphone will come on automatically. So you don't have to worry about pressing any buttons. And if we could just indicate through the chair, then it just makes sure that um, it doesn't get out of hand. That's quite sure it wouldn't. Um, can I thank all of you who um, provided written submission? That's always very helpful that we get these in advance of these roundtables. It gives a, an element of preparation um, for, for the committee. Can I refer members to paper one, which is a note by the clerk, and paper two, which is a private paper? And perhaps... Um, I thought the best way to start was with, um, as far as I know, the most up-to-date position, which is the Prime Minister has proposed a new UK-EU treaty on internal security based on three areas. And roughly these three areas, these three priorities were continued cooperation, read data drive, law enforcement and shared data bases, practical assistance, re-cross-border law enforcement operations and cooperation through specialised agencies such as Eurojust and, and Europol. So perhaps if I could get the, the panellists, the, the witnesses comments on that, that treaty and any problems, how effective it would be, any comments, um, just on the most up-to-date position. Who would like to start? Huh. Michael. <laughs> Thank you. Since, you're, since you're such a seasoned and experienced person at these oh. committees. Come now, convener. That's I a, didn't say old hand. Now. <laughs> uh, no, you didn't. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, thank you um, uh, for uh, uh, identifying me. Um, well, uh, what, did the, what did the Prime Minister say uh, at, the, uh, uh, at the meeting in Munich? Um, she talked about sa safeguarding uh, our internal security in Europe. Um, uh, she uh, explained that uh, uh, because of uh, the various terrorist atrocities which have happened recently, it was uh, something which is close to home, and um, uh, I, I know that personally. Um, uh, we... Uh, she, uh, she also explained that we must ensure that nothing prevents us from fulfilling our first duty as leaders, she's talking to the European heads of government, to protect our citizens, and we must find practical ways to ensure the cooperation to do so. When the Law Society started off uh, looking at Brexit matters, um, we issued a set of priorities to the UK government, uh, which we saw from the perspective of Scotland's solicitors. Um, uh, for, for the negotiations. Uh, and we talked about uh, the public interest areas, so ensuring stability in the law, 
maintaining freedom, justice and security, uh, ensuring that uh, the, uh, there was mutual recognition of citizens' rights throughout the EU, um, uh, and uh, creating arrangements uh, to deal with pending cases before the Court of Justice of the European Union, uh, and lastly, uh, looking uh, towards um, uh, ensuring that uh, respect is given to the devolved administrations and parliaments and legislatures, uh, and, uh, and also to uh, uh, Scots law. Uh, and so, um, when one looks at the set of priorities which we were suggesting should be taken up in any negotiations in November 2016, you can see that we're still working our way through those priorities. Uh, and uh, remember that in uh, December, um, the, uh, uh, the uh, European uh, Commission uh, and the Task Force 50 negotiators issued a joint report uh, from the negotiations which we had with the UK government, which explained that, amongst other things, there would be um, a, 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 the readiness to establish partnerships. I'm reading from the, the, uh, the guidelines issued by the European Council on the 15th of December. The readiness to establish partnerships in areas unrelated to trade and economic cooperation, in particular the fight against terrorism and international crime, as well as security, defence and foreign policy. So uh, this is uh, something which we see has been, been talked about clearly through the course of 2016 and 17, uh, and uh, we have got to the position where uh, the Prime Minister comes up with the suggestion of a new treaty. If one is looking at the options for dealing with replacing um, uh, existing uh, EU law, well, of course, the European Union withdrawal bill tells us what, what's going to happen with some of that. <coughs> uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the removal of the European Communities Act in, uh, of 1972, uh, the transposition uh, of uh, EU directives and the uh, key uh, from EU law into UK law, uh, and that comes through in terms of things like uh, the creation of um, EU-derived domestic legislation uh, and uh, EU uh, and uh, the incorporation of direct EU law. So, so there there is a process going on there in the bill, uh, which uh, tells us that there is going to be a transposition uh, effect, but most if not all, uh, of the uh, criminal uh, justice and home affairs, criminal uh, areas uh, have an element of reciprocity. Uh, and I think that that's important for us to identify uh, is this element of reciprocity. And looking at uh, the, the, uh, the question which you raised about creating a new treaty, uh, then clearly that is one of the options which one uh, could adopt uh, in, in terms of, of uh, uh, dealing with the situation we're in. Um, the, uh, there would be a possibility of keeping the framework decision and dealing with us as a third country. Uh, that would be one option. Um, there could be a specific um, European arrest warrant agreement. Um, uh, we could rely on, for, for uh, extradition purposes, on the 1957 Convention. Um, and uh, uh, there could be separate bilateral agreements, but clearly the one which has been uh, identified by the Prime Minister, a new UK-EU security treaty, uh, is uh, one which I think um, uh, seems ideally, uh, in the circumstances in which we find ourselves, uh, the one which people would move to, given the reciprocal nature of many of these obligations. But, and here is... Here is the awareness raising issue which we have to confront. Does any member have a capacity to go onto the internet at the moment? At the moment, can, can anyone access the internet? Yeah, could you, could you do so? And could you look up um, Sky News Brexit Countdown? Why, why? 
Maybe we could shortchange this, Michael, well, because um, we're, it, we've only caught an hour and a half. It will tell us that there are 402 days left until yes. the 29th of March. Right. Uh, and that, so I the think, clock is ticking. Is, we've got the picture. Is the, is the issue. Yeah, thank um, you very much for kicking that off and setting it off. Any yeah. other views? Leandro? And then Claire. Uh, yeah, um, well, there are a few issues concerning the priorities set by the, like the paper on, uh, on like future cooperation in police and, and judicial matters related to criminal justice. The first one is that um, we cannot regard uh, these three priorities, so uh, shared databases, uh, cross-border law enforcement and agencies as watertight areas. Uh, we really need a holistic approach because many of these instruments work together. Uh, we cannot think of, for example, having an agreement on the European Arrest Warrant Framework decision, or let's say you, like a European Arrest Warrant-like agreement between the EU and uh, the UK without having a related agreement on the accession of the UK and participation of the UK in uh, the Schengen Information System, for example. Uh, the Schengen Information System uh, it's like, is, or let's say, the European Arrest Warrant Framework Decision and the Schengen Information System work together because they basically allow member states to enter in the Schengen Information System alerts on wanted like people, object, missing, missing people, object, and so on and so forth. So this is a first point I would like to, uh, to make, uh, that even though at the moment a comprehensive agreement on security, let's say, so including those two priorities, seems unlikely, a fragmented and piecemeal approach, I don't think that will be very much effective. This is one reason. The other reason is that when we talk about fallback regimes, so okay, we are not going to have the European Arrest Warrant, we are going to have the uh, Council of Europe Convention extradition or uh, whatever it is. Uh, they are not absolutely uh, two comparable uh, system of interstate cooperation in criminal matters. And uh, the European Arrest Warrant is not just a variant of extradition. The European Arrest Warrant is the flagship of a complete new system of collaboration based on mutual recognition. I'm, I don't know, I don't want to like say very, very much and, and very well known things, but mutual recognition in criminal matters uh, within the European Union means that any judicial, well, any judicial order, a specific judicial <coughs> order issued by a judicial authority of a member state to another member state must be recognized and executed without any further formality unless specific grounds for refusal apply, okay? Uh, what does it mean? It means that cooperation is not a more for the executive, but is for judicial authorities, so there is a further guarantees, uh, like judicial oversight. Uh, there is the drop for 32 areas of crime of the so-called principle of double criminality, so if we want to surrender someone under the European Arrest Warrant and mutual recognition broadly. We don't need that specific offence to be criminalised in both countries. And we had the drop, partial drop, of the so-called nationality ban, so the prohibition for a member state to surrender its own national. Uh, and we have time limits, very, very strict time limits. Uh, if you compare the average time for surrender under the European Arrest Warrant, you have around maybe 60 days as compared to over one year in the case of the system of extradition. And you can take this example when it comes to the European Arrest Warrant and you can translate it in other areas of interstate cooperation in criminal matters. Exchange of evidence, for example. The UK is part of the European investigation order which is which set up a system of, uh, of, uh, of mutual recognition and exchanging of evidence uh, within the EU. Uh, and I have other, at least other two points to make, but I will. <laughs> okay, I'll bring Claire in next, and then there's a couple of members who'd like to come in. I think it's worthy of note that the development of cooperation in terms of criminal justice issues across Europe has paralleled um, a development and an increase in international crime. So crime is now a global issue in the way that it would previously certainly been perceived 
for the most part to be much more of a local or domestic issue. And we can see that, um, that there have been very positive developments made when we've been part of the, the European family in terms of primarily, as mentioned by Leandro, um, the European arrest warrant, which has become hugely um, efficient in terms of us um, both, both bringing home our own criminals who've sought refuge elsewhere and also being able to send those accused of crimes in other countries uh, to face proper trial or to receive punishment that's already been given to them. But there have also been developments more widely than that, for example, to, to address counterfeit and currency, to address terrorism, um, and, and one of the most recent developments is found in Med the Medicrime Convention, and that addresses um, sort of the, the, the use in the dark web, for example, for um, drugs that are not properly tested, produced, etc., being made available to individuals. So the, the, the issue of... of um, of cooperation, being able to protect the citizens of this country and in the broader EU, um, I think is most commonly known to the general public in terms of the European arrest warrant and that type of cooperation, Europol, exchanges of um, data, exchanges of intelligence, which are clearly hugely important. But, th but there is a broader um, aspect to this cooperation that has gone on. And certainly in the view of faculty, that the harmonisation, that cooperation, that mutual recognition um, must continue. And it must continue not only um, so that, that Scotland doesn't become, and the United Kingdom, but Scotland in particular, doesn't become a haven for those who commit particular types of crime and will either um, be able to hide from being pursued or will be able to um, receive punishment that's, that's not in line with what is available elsewhere and, and may be more favourable to individuals, but also in terms of, of individual members of the public. They may not be aware of how this cooperation impacts on their day-to-day -day life to their security and to their person, but it does, uh, and we must ensure that that continues post-Brexit. Okay, thank you. Mary and then Daniel wanted to... A specific point on that. Um, we had uh, the committee took a visit to uh, London where we met the EU Justice Subcommittee in the House of Lords. And I've been interested in some of the work that they've done on this. Uh, Lord Thomas said, given evidence to one of their committees, that the European arrest warrant operates in a fundamentally different way. Unlike treaties, it's premised upon judicial cooperation. It's very difficult to see how, if an instrument operates on that basis, it can do so without somebody at its apex to determine the rules by which it works. There is a total lack of debate about the two very different approaches to the problems of the relationship between two judicial systems, the treaty-based mechanism and the one based on cooperation. I was also interested in the evidence from COPFS, where he said that uh, in terms of the European arrest warrant, its key features are to make extradition a judicial rather than a political process. So it was really just to, in, in terms of that comment that I'd initially just read out there from Lord Thomas, to see if that's an element that you agree with in terms of you know, the lack of the debate on that and the, the current position as it stands at the moment and why having that, uh, the system of judicial cooperation is important in that way and how it is different from any other political process. And maybe, Daniel, if you bring in your point too, then you can see who wants yeah, to pick up on this. It follows directly on from, from, from what Mary was just saying there, and that, that when we're you know, looking at what our alternatives are or, or how this might work going forward in the future, I mean, we've heard that this is actually, you know, rather than just a simple kind of bilateral treaty, this is actually a kind of a very complicated institutional and judicial relationship that's going on. So what... what, what what do, you know, do the other models look like? In particular, thinking about Norway and given that the, it, it has a, a, a specific treaty that, that recognises that the European arrest warrant, I mean, how does that work? I mean, is that, is that essentially, uh, is that a potential model for the UK? Are there drawbacks? Are there other relationships that the EU or indeed the UK has with other jurisdictions which might serve as a, a, as a model uh, uh, you know, for a, a future relationship to, to enable this to work? And that, Dr. Glover, do you have a view? On that, uh, not so much. I, I would pick up on what um, Claire said there. I think the devil in this lies in, in the data um, and the arrangements that are made for intelligence transfer um, and, and for data transfer. Um, 
less certain on the EU law in relation to it, but re uh, retention of the databases to which um, they currently have access to would be, would be critical. And the ongoing role of, of, of the Court of Justice uh, is critical to making that work. That said, I think it's, it's worth remembering. I, th I think there is a will, or there seem on, on, on the basis of what I've read, there, there is a will, I think, to make this work between the, the two parties and to, and to keep, almost to keep as much of the status quo post-Brexit as, as they can. Yeah. Uh, I wondered perhaps, Helen, you know, from the COPF point of view, if you could comment. Yes, I mean, from our perspective, it's a, it's a very practical, it's a very practical consideration um, as to whether we will be able to uh, you know, serve the purposes of securing surrender or extradition or securing evidence um, from European colleagues in the way that we've been able to do uh, until now. Um, and I think, uh, to go back to your, the, the original point of, of the Prime Minister's um, uh, uh, wish as expressed in the, in the Munich speech. I mean, if, if this all-embracing treaty were to be delivered and it were to have um, pr both preserve the position insofar as can be done, albeit under a different legal basis as this is at present, but also importantly, and as I have, as I have understood the, the UK government's position to, to preserve the capacity to further innovate in the future in terms of its relationship with European partners, then it might be said that actually the practical impact of Brexit from the point of view of the Scottish and UK prosecutor might have um, might be minimal, but I think um, I think you know colleagues around this t table have have identified the, the, the two issues that might uh, there are the real challenges to that, and that is the issue of data sharing, and the issue of who arbitrates in the, in the event of dispute. And I think these are still the challenges that need to be um, need to be properly. Uh, bottomed out and until we know how that's to be dealt with it's, it's difficult to give a proper assessment as to what the, 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 the practical impact will be. Uh -huh. Ben you had to comment and John did you want to come in this area? Th thank you Vera. Just, just, th thanks for that contribution. I just wanted to pick up on that point and also what uh, Dr Cover said about the ongoing role of the Court of Justice. I think that point about the who is the, the final arbiter is so crucial and you know, that was also highlighted by the, 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 the report from uh, the uh, European Union Committee of the House of Lords uh, when we spoke to them too. It is, you know, it, and for me, that comes down to how will this operate in practice? Uh, given the expertise around the table, both in terms of uh, theory and academia and in, in practice, without the Court of Justice as the final arbiter, is there a way that such reciprocity that we have right now can continue? Can such effective operations in the way that, that, that for example, the European Rest Warrant has provided be sustained without that final arbiter being shared and that reciprocity being understood? And John, on, on, on your point too, which I think yeah. is related. It's specifically for Ms Nisbet, and it is about the practical implications that have been alluded to. Um, presumably, uh, there's, there's a bit of a lead-in time before a warrant is actually applied for. There will be complicated cross-border cases. Transitional arrangements would be crucial if there were any change, presumably. What, what are the practical implications if, if there were to be a delay in, in, or indeed be nothing in place to secure the arrest of an individual, please? Helen? Yeah. Well, I mean, there's two aspects. One, and, and, and it's almost something you need to model through, and we're, we're still actually in the process of doing that. You'd, you would need to model through um, two scenarios. One where you, you were effectively one day operating under EU law and perhaps with the same investigation and same prosecution the following day operating under whatever followed it in whatever way. Um, so, I mean, but the, the, that's, not a, that's not a unique, I mean, that, that's not a unique and unheard of proposition. There, there are examples when, for instance, you know, S Scotland can't take a decision to move from a common law offence to a statutory offence, and, you know, that would have the same. So there are models for looking at that. Um, on the, the, the other point of what could follow, well, ult ultimately, if there was, uh, if there was no, um, no deal, if I, can, if I can express it that way, um, the, I think the working assumption is that we would fall back on the, um, the Council of Europe 
uh, conventions of 1957 and 1959, which deal with extradition and mutual legal assistance, respectively. Um, but there are some there are some questions there, you know, with, within that that still need to be to be answered. Um, there are um, there there are provisions within both the uh, the framework decision that governs EAWs and the directive that governs the new uh, European investigation order that at least pose the question as to whether they actually replace for participating states within those systems, whether they replace the, the pre-existing conventions. And there, there does need to be, you know, that, that issue needs to be bottomed out. And there is also a sef separate issues, particularly with relation to extradition, that um, under the 1957 convention, a number of member states will not surrender their own or extradite their own nationals. So again, there are, there are practical sort of impact assessments that need to be done country by country to, to determine what the, um, the, the, the impacts would be in terms of uh, future relationships. Before I bring Michael in, Lauren, uh, Lauren Ness, are you, you nodding? Is there anything you'd like to add to? Well, just regarding, so obviously, um, the repeal, a, lot, a number of countries have repealed the 1957 Act, and the comment with regards to whether we can have a, a similar um, system that Norway have, what we need to be mindful of is they are still part of Schengen. So in that respect, that may not be open to ourselves. And as Leandro says, things can't be looked in isolation. They have to look at the interoperability um, and how each of the different um, justice and home affairs measures rely on each other um, and able to work efficiently. Michael? So, <clears throat> thank you, convener. Um, if uh, there is to be what the EU considered to be a partnership against terrorism um, and international crime and the UK think of as being a deep and special partnership um, in, in terms of practical and operational cooperation. That looks like it's not that far apart, but of course, when you dig into the detail uh, and you find the red line uh, of the CJEU, then that presents a difficulty. And it will present a difficulty sooner rather than later, um, uh, because um, it, the, if, if one uh, remembers the agreement in December uh, about citizens' rights, uh, those citizens' rights uh, are still going to be capable in the transitional period of being referred to the CJEU, right? Um, and indeed, the, the 8 December agreement, the joint report, tells us that that will continue for eight years. Now, that's in relation to citizens' rights. Eight years from exit. The difficulty, I suppose, is that in the transition arrangements, the UK will not be participative in the EU institutions. So therefore, not only will we not have a commissioner and MEPs and, uh, uh, and, and all the rest that goes with that, we won't have a judge. In fact, the three judicial officers from the CJEU will have to leave. So we could have the peculiar situation of the CJEU dealing with cases where there is no British judge in post, and that presents, I think, some difficulties. Um, but treaties invariably have some kind of mechanism for dealing with disputes. Uh, and it would be, what are the, the question to be asked of the UK government and the EU would be, in this proposed treaty, what would be the idea for dealing with um, any disputes which arise out of the topics in that? And I take Leandro's point uh, that it, it is a much larger vista than the European arrest warrant. There's all the other uh, practical cooperative elements, Eurodact, uh, Eurojust, the, uh, uh, the EU, Lisa, and the rest. Yeah. I think that's the point that, that you brought up as well, Claire, just in the, the, the case of a dispute. Would international ar arbitration rules help in any way here? Well, in response to that, and also in response to the MSP, Ms. Gurdjian's question um, in regards to um, Lord Thomas's quote, um, the, the Faculty of Advocates provided written evidence um, to the House of Lords um, EU Justice Subcommittee in respect of um, Brexit enforcement and dispute resolution is there a role for the Court of Justice of the European Union? Now, the quote from Lord Thomas, which, which essentially said that for the operation of, of an extradition treaty um, with the EU, um, 
is different from a European arrest warrant. And as, as, as said in the quote, a European arrest warrant um, really is, is premised upon judicial cooperation. And of course, Lord Thomas says it's difficult to see how that instrument could operate without a body at its apex. And the faculty agrees with that. Um, and, and in its written evidence, it went on to say, in the event that rulings from the Court of Justice of the European Union lose their status as binding authority, there's nothing to stop those rulings remaining as persuasive authority. Scottish courts routinely draw from cases in other jurisdictions, and there is no reason why this should not apply to those from the East J CJEU. It is possible that there may be some divergence in approach by the courts, but this should not be overstated. CJEU rulings have become embedded in UK jurisprudence and it is unlikely that they will suddenly be departed from, especially in the area of criminal justice, where it should be obvious and desirable that a consistent approach is applied in both jurisdictions. Now, the, the, they go on to raise, in the written response, it goes on to raise um, issues that may arise where you have kind of inconsistent interpretation of jurisprudence. But certainly, it's a, it's a question that the faculty, the faculty shared the concern expressed by Lord Thomas. Uh, and certainly, it, where we are in terms, of, um, in, in terms of the provisions and the agreements that have been reached in terms of what the future will look like, the worst case scenario is that the decisions of, of the Court of Justice was, would continue to have a persuasive um, authority. Okay, Leandro and then Philip. Yeah, um, yeah, just like two points briefly. Uh, firstly, uh, before discussing uh, about the effectiveness of a system where there's no, let's say, authority or jurisdiction of the Court of Justice of the European Union, I think that we should uh, deal with a preliminary question, a uh, preliminary scenario. What about the Court of Justice, because the Court of Justice will have to decide on the legality of an agreement. What about the Court of Justice decide that uh, the, they are not willing to uh, leave and their control and interpretative monopoly over such a sensitive area, such as police and judicial cooperation in criminal matters? Uh, let's not forget that uh, the Court of Justice not that long ago has had no problems in throwing in the bin, let's say, uh, years and years of work uh, on the accession of the EU to the European Convention of Human Rights on the specific argument that it was undermining the autonomy of European Union law. So this is like the first point we should take into account. Let's not just jump to the conclusion and let's not take for granted that there will be an autonomous body or international, like international arbitration model on a potential agreement, because the Court of Justice will have to decide whether uh, such an external body, the presence of such, uh, such an external body is compatible with European Union law. Uh, secondly, um, there is, the, let's say, the dark side of police and judicial cooperation in criminal matters, that is law enforcement, uh, but there is also the bright side, so how actually judicial cooperation in criminal matters uh, helps uh, improve and, and increase the standard of protection of individuals subject to investigation and uh, uh, criminal proceedings all over Europe, and which I think has been somehow neglected uh, in the debate and especially in the police paper so far. An example is the European Supervision Order, uh, which is another instrument of uh, mutual recognition in criminal matters within the EU. So the European Supervision Order, the framework decision on the European Supervision Order, allows for mutual recognition of pre-trial measures alternative to deprivation of liberty, to detention. Which means that if I'm, for example, a UK national, and I'm subject to uh, investigations in another member state, uh, on normal conditions, uh, the judicial, the competent authority in, the, in that member state will not be very keen to uh, grant uh, a, an alternative, a pretrial measure alternative to detention because they have no way of, mm, let's say, controlling me because I'm not resident there. I'm not uh, a resident in that country and so, as happening like 95% of the time when they don't have this possibility, 
they just go for detention. What the European supervision order allows for is that basically we recognize a pretrial measure alternative to detention and we send back the person to the country of like residence or nationality. So we have effectiveness of law enforcement and cross-border crime prosecution while, however, uh, improving the, the standard of protection uh, and even individual rights uh, all over Europe. So this is another, like, another like, right. aspect. Right. That we Thank should, you. Yeah. Philip? Um, I, I was just going to come back to um, the idea of, of data and, and the mention of alternatives, perhaps the idea of alternative methods of, of dispute resolution. Uh, as I understand it, um, the, the fallback position or, or the position that the position the UK has been advised to take on, on data protection is to seek an adequacy decision if it falls uh, in order to ensure that data transfers, if it becomes what's, what, what's like a third country, um, necessitates, like it has done for the US and the Privacy Shield and the Umbrella Agreements, to seek CJEU approval that the measures in place to secure data transfers flow uninterrupted. I'm guessing that that might be why there, there's there's been such readiness to concede the CJEU red line for the next two years, as I understand it. As regards alternatives, uh, I'm going to plagiarise Professor Catherine Barnard here, uh, I'm a professor of EU law at the University of Cambridge. I can't claim this is my own. But um, there is an idea um, that's, I'm not sure how much traction it's gained so far, but the idea that because because there seems to be this UK red line over the CJEU, which may be as much about maybe semantics or posturing as anything else, I, I don't know, but it's the idea that arbitration could be undertaken by the European Free Trade Association Court or EFTA Court. Um, it, it is judges from the three EFTA countries under its jurisdiction, and um, its judgments aren't binding on its members, nor are they obliged to seek guidance from it. They've never deviated really from what the CJEU has to say, but what they can do is issue, um, they can issue findings that the UK might be able to sell as palatable to those who would find the same ruling from the CJEU uh, less pal pal palatable. I'm, I'm not sure, but the idea is out there. Um, and the idea, perhaps, that there are no alternatives to CJEU um, is, is, maybe, is maybe premature. There may, there may be other models. Right, I, so the EFTA court potentially could yeah. fill the gap. Claire, you wanted to come in, and then yes. I've got some members wanting to come in. In a commercial environment, or indeed in terms of civil um, liability, I think arbitration has a role, a, a very effective role. However, when it comes to determining an individual's liberty, and the, the restriction of that liberty. It's faculty's um, opinion that arbitration or other forms of, of dispute, alternative dispute resolution would not be appropriate. And if something as serious as the withdrawal of liberty is to take place, whether that be through transfer or imprisonment of an individual, then that must be subjected uh, to reasoned legal analysis and the process of arbitration would not be suitable. That's, that's helpful to, to rule that out, but keep EFTA court in as a possibility. Um, I know you want to come in, Michael, but I'm going to bring in a couple of members. Um, if Liam MacArthur, uh, then Rona. Liam? Thanks, I mean, I think it's the question I was going to ask has largely been um, uh, touched on by a number of, of witnesses. It was following on from Ben's question about whether the red line in terms of, of arbitration is an absolute um, or are there, are, are there degrees within it? And I think we've already explored with a number of contributions. But I think one of the issues that arose in our earlier sessions um, uh, in relation to civil law and the impact of Brexit was around alternatives. And I think, uh, I think Helen mentioned um, reference to Council of Europe um, uh, um, mechanisms. I think in previous sessions we've heard of, of UN resolutions that have been a, a fallback and actually we had quite a lively debate as to whether or not those processes were um, more advantageous in terms of their development, in terms of their reach, etc. I'm not getting the impression that in the area of policing and criminal justice there is anything like that prospect, possibly for the reasons that, that Claire has just elucidated, but it would be helpful maybe to get confirmation that that is indeed the case. 
And Rona, just to bring in your point. Yeah, well, uh -huh. Part of it follows on from what Liam said. It was really just to get a sort of general view of how you think the negotiating positions on the EU and the UK are going. Um, and do, do you think they're getting their priorities right in terms of um, policing and um, the effect it will have on the Scottish legal system? Um, you know, and the proposed treaty, if I'm understanding it correctly, is a treaty, but the details still to be decided. Um, so how much of an input is that? Is, is Scotland going to have to that? It's kind of my, or my thoughts. Michael, you wanted to come in? Are you happy? Thank you, Convera. Uh, the, um, I have to say I'm not convinced about the EFTA court um, because EFTA is a free trade association uh, uh, and it doesn't really do crime. Um, uh, to be honest, um, uh, from, from uh, what I've seen of it. Um, uh, the uh, Carl Badenbaucher, who's the president of the EFTA court, said in a, a talk that he gave in Edinburgh last year that you either have to be in the EU uh, or in EFTA in order to get the advantages of free trade between the two, uh, and you can't switch between the two to get the advantage of a court or something like that. You would have to be a member of EFTA to be able to access the EFTA court. And, and that tells us something about then accessing the EFTA treaty um, and, and uh, so on and so forth. So our 410 days get sliced down to even less, fewer days, fewer days. Uh, and uh, so, so therefore, I'm not persuaded by uh, Professor Barnard's suggestion that you could use it as an arbitration for the reasons that Claire has enunciated um, uh, um, and, and also because it's just not suited to do that kind of job. Um, the, uh, may I say something about where, where one thinks the negotiations are? Because I think we, we're in the process of negotiations during the course of this week, and if you look at the agendas for the negotiation meetings on the Task Force 50 website, they are scant. Uh, they just tell you that a meeting is going to take place. It doesn't tell you anything about the meat of the agenda or what is going to be discussed. Um, uh, what we know is that we're moving from the, the, the basic phase uh, of, uh, uh, and that happened in December, into the future relationship. Uh, and that is uh, a, a significant undertaking uh, to, to view the, uh, the future relationship because there are so many competing issues which might uh, um, be considered. Clearly, keeping our people safe is considered to be one of the prime objectives of government. Uh, and if, we, if, if government takes that as its priority, then this uh, proposed treaty and any uh, other, uh, other form of agreement between the EU and the UK should be the priority, uh, be, because underpinning the rule of law in our society means that other things can then happen, like making contracts and uh, uh, having uh, families and, and uh, doing our jobs uh, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis without fear of crime or terrorism. So making the rule of law a fundamental part of this process access to justice and the interests of justice. We don't hear very much about this. When um, the, uh, the discussions about the CJEU were going on in pending cases last year, both the UK and the EU issued papers about how the CJEU should be perceived, but it was essentially a managerial exercise about pending cases. And uh, we, Law Society, wrote to both Michel Barnier and David Davis to say, but where are issues like the rule of law and the interests of justice and all of this? Because that, these are important features that we ignore or forget about at our peril. Leandro? Uh, sorry, do you want to come in again? Just a tiny bit supplementary. I'm interested to know, Police Scotland and the Crown Office, if you think we are, we're going to have enough time to have these reassure, to reassure um, the public that you know, they will be safe. I mean, are we, you know, because time's getting on and, you know, these things have not been decided yet. Um, is there any sense of, uh, you know, panic? I think we're almost crystal ball gazing at uh -huh. with that question, Rona, but, but by all means, well, just, um, reply if you've... If, uh, well, then, from a policing perspective, 
perspective, our law enforcement perspective, there is um, a lot of work getting done by the NCE and the MPCC um, of a number of law enforcement agencies to identify as practitioners what our priorities are um, to keep basically the, keep, to keep people safe. Um, so there is a lot of work going done, getting done in the background and they're reporting directly into the Home Office for their, um, to their EU team. Um, and alongside a number of colleagues from Scottish agencies, we're working in contingency work with the Home Office. So it is at whatever pace they can go at because it is crystal ball time. But there is, there is work getting done in the background and there's certainly um, monthly, if not more, more so meetings regarding that. Yeah. Leandro, sorry. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, just like to build on Claire's point, uh, the unsuitability of an arbitration or EFTA court model for uh, police and judicial cooperation in criminal matters. And like to stress the uniqueness of being part of the European Union and of the EU law system in this specific area. Uh, judicial cooperation in criminal matters and police cooperation within the European Union are built on the fundamental principle of mutual trust. That means, uh, that, is a, that operates as a presumption that fundamental rights are respected throughout the European Union. What happens when someone, when a country leaves the European Union or what happens when interaction takes place with someone some, some countries outside the European Union. It means that that presumption does not apply anymore. And it means that while when you are part of the European Union, you benefit, you benefit from that presumption, which means that uh, unless and until you are, let's say there are concrete evidence that in that specific situation, you are not complying with fundamental rights, judicial, and um, judicial cooperation and police cooperation operate. They cannot be limited. The, this relationship between rule and exception is reversed when you deal with someone like a country that is outside the European Union. And we, and uh, of course, this like uh, different relationship between rule and exception operate in different manners depending on the context. But this is an example, I think, that we can see also in the case of data protection uh, with uh, the Schrems case of the Court of Justice and on the ruling of the Court of Justice on the basically impossibility to presume the US in that specific case as complying with uh, the, EU, the EU data protection standard. So this is another thing we should, like another drawback of not being part of the club, let's say. <coughs> So we cannot, we, the UK will not be like presumed anymore as complying with fundamental standard, okay. the EU at least. Mm, Mary? Yeah, but specifically on that point that you just talked about there, about <coughs> data protection and what you'd raised earlier, uh, Dr. Weber too, because that was one area I was quite interested in and uh, data adequacy. Um, and it was just really, if you could generally just explain a bit more about that, uh, why that's going to be so important, because I think when I've been looking into this, there have been ex um, fears expressed by some that in terms of deeming whether or not the UK is going to be uh, meet the standards of data adequacy, the time that it can take for that decision to be made uh, by the European Commission uh, could slow things down. Um, but also the fact uh, it's how the UK then deals with other countries as well and it's about the free flow of data with other countries that we have through the EU at the moment. So for example if we don't get that adequacy decision what does that mean? Uh, does that mean that we lose free access to data from any other nations such as the EU US Privacy Shield which you mentioned uh, and does that mean that we would lose that until another agreement where we have to reach individual agreements with each of these other countries too? And you want to address that one and, and probably factor into it, you know, we're, we're looking worst case scenario here. Is it, is it bad for us, but equally bad perhaps for um, EU countries? In other words, would there be any reason why it would be an advantage not to um, cooperate in the, the sharing of, of data? And if they didn't, obviously Marie's, Marie's questions come 
I'm very much in force. Anyone would like to look at that? I'm wondering if, if perhaps, Philip, you want to look at the EFTA and maybe address this one too, because you did see EFTA court um, just now complies with just about all the uh, judgments, but the point's been made out of the European court, but um, the judgment, uh, the point's been made, perhaps it isn't suitable for justice for criminals. Um, yeah, the, it's by no means certain that the UK would have to seek an adequacy decision. That's, that's kind of um, a fallback should it become necessary to treat it as a third country, um, probably on a, on a very hard Brexit as I understand it. I'm reasonably confident they can agree or will agree. Um, firstly, on the standard data protection or flows of data, we have the GDPR, which the UK is going to honour from May 2018. Intelligence sharing and, and national security related data and law enforcement data are subject to slightly different rules and they are subject to, um, well, when I say different rules, they're outside the idea of general data protection and they are, um, they are subject to the CJEU's oversight and they are a jealous, that, that court is a jealous supporter of, of fundamental rights to data protection. It takes a very dim view. You referred to the, the Schrems case there. It takes a very dim view of where it sees threats to your fundamental right to um, data protection as recognised in the Charter. That said, there are a number of arrangements now. Um, sadly, scanning up and down this document is slower than uh, turning a page. But there are a number of satisfactory um, data sharing arrangements with third countries that, that have been entered into um, by the EU, not least the US. Now, the Court of Justice, ha I appreciate it's still, it's still not settled uh, in the Court of Justice of the European Union just how legal, for want of a better term, the, the current privacy shield or umbrella arrangement with the US is. Adequacy, adequacy decisions, to answer your point, are, they are time consuming, um, but where the political will sits behind the current arrangements, I don't see that as a, as a threat to getting a rubber stamp on how the UK currently transfers data to the EU and receives data back from the EU. I personally think it's unthinkable that um, any of the practitioners here would lose access to the databases or intelligence they currently have while the details of, of this um, treaty are, th are thrashed out. Data is simply, it, it, it is simply the, the, the gold currency now between, between nations and I just find it unthinkable that they won't, they won't get an adequate settlement um, worked out. That said, if it falls to an adequacy decision, that, that will take time to formalise. Um, as regards your point, I, I accept your point about the, the, the EFTA court. That said, it was purely in the area of adequacy of, of data transfer that that, that point's being mooted rather than an overall, uh, as an overall arbiter for the whole treaty, perhaps. It's more in relation to, to data that I was referring to. If I could perhaps pick up again the point Liam uh, MacArthur made, um, if worst case scenario, you know, some of these things don't come to fruition, is there other treaties? Is there a convention, the Hague Convention, that, that can play a part here in, in um, helping out any of the areas where there may be a problem with transfer? Anyone like to take the Hague Convention? <laughs> Philip? Outside my area of expertise. Outside to be everyone's honest, area, be... is it? Nobody want to comment on that? L Leandro? The, the Hague Convention, uh, is there anywhere that it might play a part or other treaties if, you know, the. Um, the, the kind of negotiations fall down and this is the fallback position? Would that, would, would it? I think that's what you were asking, wasn't it, Liam? A discussion um, during uh, our evidence on civil matters um, that those conventions could play a role in, in, in plugging a gap. But as I say, I think um, the, the impression I got was that there wasn't a similar opportunity in relation to the criminal justice issues we're discussing here. The body language of, of Leandro was giving me my answer, but maybe he wants to put something onto the record. Yeah, I, I'm pretty like sceptical, just for, like for the reasons I, men I mentioned I mentioned earlier that the like the two systems because we we, we tend sometimes to think about 
of the system of cooperation, police and judicial cooperation, which are, which are, of course are connected, but have to be kept separately. Uh, um, we tend to think of these forms of cooperation as just, you know, another form of international law or international law cooperation in criminal in criminal matters and in police in, in police in policing, but it's not. Uh, so I I think that we should be realistic enough to uh, accept the possibility that any fallback regime would be far 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 less effective. Yeah. From like both like enforcement perspective and right protection. Yeah. Helen, do you like to come in there? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Again, to, to develop this on MacArthur's point, I, th I, think, um, I think there's a general consensus amongst practitioners in law enforcement that, that the evolution that's taking place over 40 years within the European Union has allowed us to reach a point where we are, we are operating uh, in a mutual cooperation, judicial cooperation basis as, as optimally as we can be. And also we're on the cusp of, of you know, the, the sense that we're on the cusp of future breakthroughs in terms of... Um, in terms of being able to do, you know, further kind of lifetime interrogation of systems that would get information back to home countries more quickly. But I think it's important to, to, to say, as a practitioner as well, that um, international cooperation will not, will not cease if there's no deal in, 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 in the course of the Brexit negotiations. Um, Scotland and the UK um, deal with uh, other countries all the time. Sometimes, you know, for the first time, you can sometimes deal with a, a, a state uh, for the first time, or sometimes not a state for the first time. And you know, I, I've, I'm, what I'm thinking of is a uh, recent extradition case involving Taiwan. You, there, there is always a scope if the will is there on both sides to to um, reach agreements and to secure cooperation, uh, and that happens with states all across the world. The point is, and I think it's a point that, that, that Leandro's making, that without, you know, with, without the interdependent network of options, suite of options that we have at the moment, um, we are faced with something that's going to be um, somewhat less effective than, than um, the, the point we're at just now. Now, I'm conscious we've got about another half hour and you may have come with a particular um, issue that you wanted to raise. So I'm going to go round the table and just see if there's anything that we haven't covered that you would now, you know, want to put on the table or, or out there. And, and Lorraine, could I start with you and could I ask you maybe to cover a wee bit more on the, the medic crime and the cyber crime um, aspects and, and just how that's all playing out? There's very much... Well, unfortunately, I can't... Um, I wouldn't be able to assess at all with the medic crime. Right, because um, that's not within. Um, that's not organ. Is that organs or people used I, to I human? I couldn't begin to tell you. Okay, so right. That's not, <laughs> I wouldn't even like to guess. So right. um, perhaps somebody else will be able to pick up on that. Um, but no, purely from a, a, a practitioner's point of view, we have a number of measures that we've identified as being our priorities that link, as uh, Leandro has said, that one will not function without the other. And the Schengen information system that uh, Leandro alluded to. Um, earlier on, has only been in place since 2015, but is a hugely effective tool for frontline policing to keep both the community safe and our police officers, because they get real-time information with regards to if somebody is wanted in another country, or if they're a violent individual with regards um, to the crimes they've previously committed. <clears throat> and prior to the year prior to it coming into effect in April 2015, we executed 73 European arrest warrants, and that jumped to 111. Um, because we had real-time access to this information, and that will be lost if we don't have access to the CIS2. Um, whilst Norway's been mentioned again, it has access to CIS2, even though it's not an EU member, but again, they're within the Schengen area, so they have access. So I think, I think it's just to put across, is that from a practitioner's point of view, there are key measures that we would be keen, or, or we have, obviously informed um, Home Office, which are our priorities, um, and do... Are, are more inter, um, interdependent than others. Turkey, I saw that mentioned somewhere as a candidate state, so it wasn't any formal treaties, but it seemed to be copied in or, or a party to, to, to some of the, the kind of agreements just on that basis. This will be for Europol, a lot of it to do with Europol and their access to information in Europol. So um, at the moment, the UK enjoys full membership within Europol, so we can influence the direction of Europol and the priorities. And for one of the, one, one of the new priorities, which has been influenced by the UK this year, is wildlife crime. 
So when we no longer have full membership, we will no have we won't we won't have an influencing um, opportunity. So you then become either a strategic member, which is like Albania and Russia, where no personal data is exchanged, um, or you go to operational, which is like USA, Canada, and Norway, which is fuller membership than your strategic partners, but you still don't have um, full membership. So you're influencing. Um, opportunity is gone, and I think the UK government's seeking to um, eke out a, a more unique um, relationship with Europol. But how realistic that is, we don't know. Okay, thank you for that, Michael. Um, something which uh, I, I think is quite important for us to appreciate is that that um, we will be safe the day after exit. You know, I, I have every confidence that that will be the case. Um, I, I would like to think that um, the negotiators will reach agreement uh, on the key points and that even if we don't have a full-blown treaty, we will have heads of agreement uh, which uh, could give an indication and that could be lodged at the UN and, and be, uh, be used as the basis for an agreement between uh, the UK and the EU. The, um, I'll send this on to, to the committee, uh, but uh, the, the, uh, there was an ad hoc working party on Article 50, and Gillian Maudsley, who's in the audience, uh, dug this out for me um, uh, on police and judicial cooperation in criminal matters, uh, and that took place on the 23rd of January um, uh, this year. So it talks about the various default positions if there is no agreement. So um, uh, either international conventions like Council of Europe or UN, uh, Interpol, uh, bilateral relationships which we have with member states uh, and uh, what they are terming soft measures uh, and that's exchanges of non-personal data uh, and, uh, and other kind of global initiatives and uh, I think that uh, if one looked at the consequences of applying the third country model to the UK although you don't get access to the database there might be data exchange uh, and uh, uh, me um, any, any kind of interruption of, in the flow causes delay. Delay can be troublesome, but um, I, 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 th I think there might be ways to work around that. A new treaty will open up some of the, uh, well, indeed all of the issues which it contains to further examination uh, and debate. And one of the things about the debate in this country <coughs> is that it is introspective. We are wondering what we are going to get in the negotiations, how we are going to uh, uh, make sure that, that uh, the EU yields to our position. That might be the mantra uh, that uh, um, government ministers are using. But in fact, there are 27 other people involved in the room uh, and we don't know enough about what the other member states will want in this debate. And if the treaty opens up, let's say the European arrest warrant, uh, Leandro has written, uh, I think, about uh, the issues which uh, uh, have come up in the European arrest warrant in the ECJ and difficulties which member states have with aspects of the uh, arrest warrant, and that will apply to the other uh, initiatives as well. Uh, and, uh, and I think that that means that we've got to be uh, alert to the fact that what might come out will be something completely different from the status quo which we have at the moment. It may not be, it might be an improvement, uh, indeed, uh, on uh, some of the things which, which currently um, hold back uh, the European arrest warrant for, from realising its full potential. Uh, and things like uh, issues of proportionality, um, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the questions of dual representation, relationship with fundamental rights, these kinds of things will start to be debated um, more openly. I think, and, and that, that's something for us to be alert to because um, we need to be able to make representations. And you asked um, uh, earlier about the position of Scots law. And of course, uh, when one looks at, let's say, the UK's um, uh, partnership paper on security, crime, etc., for the future, um, uh, there is, I think, one paragraph which says, and we will also talk to the devolved administrations. Uh, now, uh, we have a particular system in Scotland, which means that the Lord Advocate is independent. Um, although he is a Scottish minister, he conducts uh, the, the operation of prosecution of crime 
independently of Scottish ministers. And I think that, that uh, it was a point which we made to uh, the UK government when we responded to that paper. Uh, but I think we've got to be alert all the time uh, to issues which may come up, which might have an impact on the Scottish legal system uh, and our legal heritage. <laughs> not, a, not an aspic frozen legal heritage, but one which is open to change and which will, will go with the flow uh, to improve the lives of people who live here. Okay, thank you for that. And Claire. Um, I, I don't have a great deal to add to what I've said already on behalf of the Faculty of Advocates, um, but I would say that clearly mutual cooperation is in the interests of, of all countries, um, but time is of the essence. Noted. <laughs> Anne Helm. Uh, thank you. Just to develop uh, uh, what Michael was saying uh, in terms of the... the uh, the unique position of, of Scots law, certainly as I think it's reflected in, in our paper. I think in terms of our planning and particular our, our, our sort of technical provision of technical advice and feeding into to, um, UK government colleagues, the, the, the key things that we are wishing to emphasise is the the unique uh, the unique position, the unique nature of, of, of the Scottish legal system and its criminal justice system and um, also did they properly take account in terms of the development of any thinking of the role of, of the Lord Advocate. And as a secondary, a secondary aspect to that in terms of um, looking forward is, is our desire to preserve the identity that COPFS and the International Cooperation Unit has been able to, to, create, to, to create for itself um, within Europe and to allow us to continue with sort of direct uh, contact and cooperation with, with, with European colleagues in whatever arrangements um, emerge. And at also at a secondary level to emphasise the importance of, of Scottish law enforcement being able to, to do that as well. Okay, thank you for that. Leandra? Uh, <coughs> yeah, just speaking of like the, let's say, Brexit paradox, so uh, what, the, what does the UK need to do to get part of the club? And one example we were mentioning before was being part of Schengen, uh, like uh, and other third countries that want to like fully join the system of police and judicial cooperation of um, of criminal matters. There's another uh, interesting issue, and it is the compliance with the European Union law and the Charter in particular. Uh, if we say that the UK is going to reach an agreement uh, with uh, the European Union on the like a comprehensive agreement, a specific agreement anyway, on police and judicial cooperation in criminal matters. Uh, basically, the UK will have to comply uh, with European Union law standards. There is no scenario when the EU signs an agreement with a third country without the, that third country uh, giving reassurance that the EU law standards especially when it comes to fundamental rights protection, will be complied with. Uh, and it will be a very interesting situation to see, like, the w one of the main arguments uh, for Brexit, so we don't want to be bound by the Charter of Fundamental Rights anymore than getting back through the window uh, at the moment of signing this agreement uh, between the UK and the EU, and which condition that you, uh, the, the UK will need to comply with. So this is like something I think that we should like consider. So on which condition the UK will be able to sign an agreement on this issue with specific regard to fundamental rights. Okay, thank you for that, Phil. Um, I haven't much more to add other than that it, it, it seems, it seems um, possible, indeed the US, um, much pilloried over its surveillance activities, for instance, um, post Snowden, has shown that it, it, is, it is possible to continue to cooperate with the, the EU on an acceptable um, basis. Their current operational arrangement with Europol includes cooperation in relation to drug trafficking, human trafficking, trafficking in nuclear and radioactive substances, people smuggling, terrorism, um, and an ongoing exchange of um, intelligence and information and there's I think there's 16 of those operational agreements that um, Detective Chief Inspector Lorraine Henderson spoke of so 
as I say, I'm, I'm, it's, it's difficult, obviously, while the negotiations take place and, and no one really knows what's happening in them. And we're left with the media to guide us um, as to what might be happening or, or, or what might not happen. That's, that's where we all are, frankly, in, in, in my view. But um, the idea, as I say, I, I remain fundamentally optimistic that any type of Brexit will see a comprehensive settlement on policing and justice cooperation um, that I don't think we'll have to concede very much. That's, that's helpful. There's just one last issue that um, was mentioned, I think, in one of the submissions, and that was the, the Irish situation, the Supreme Court, the 20 um, cases pending, and perhaps some dubiety about whether there would be, was it an extradition? Uh, was it the Law Society or the Crown and Procurator Fiscal's um, submission? Yeah. Would you like to comment a little bit further on you well, know, what the various... I scenarios think, here? Well, it's hard to know at the moment, I th I th but I think, I think it's an example um, of how, as, uh, as negotiations continue uh, without particular, you know, with, without a kind of concrete clarity as to, as to which direction they're heading and as to how, um, how that lack of certainty can be, um, can, can come to the fore in individual court, court cases and uh, in essence, to, just to, to gum up the works in a way that maybe hasn't all, always hadn't been particularly anticipated. I mean, this, this decision was just uh, earlier this month, and it's, it's, I, as I understand it, is to be referred uh, via the Irish Supreme Court under an expedited procedure to the to the uh, to the CGEU. Um, I don't think it's yet been determined whether the CGEU has will accept it or not, or the parameters in which it will accept it. It will also allow, I think, an opportunity for all member states and other parties, for that matter, to become um, to enter into the proceedings. So, you know, it it it, um, it offers uh, it is a situation where you, you were, were watching closely to see what may flow from it. But I think I think the, the practical implication in terms of, again, the, the, the 20 pending cases in Ireland is that that might, that might start to be something that becomes more of a feature generally uh, in terms of, of uh, extradition to the UK as individual parties are looking at the Brexit situation and saying, well, what, 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 what advice, if I'm, if I'm a lawyer representing someone in Belgium who's facing uh, s surrender under an EAW, what advice should I be offering my, my client as to what, what approach they should be taking in, in their extradition proceedings, uh, given the, the uncertainty around Brexit? And is it the case that um, before Brexit that that would have gone through without any question that there would be no question of the, the member state exercising its right to perhaps say, well, in this case, I'm not sure if I'm, 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 I'm going to comply? Well, I think it certainly, it certainly seems, it's, it's, in, in terms of this decision, it's, 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 the, it's, the bre it's Brexit that has been invoked as being the, as being the, as creating the problem, as being the, as being the impediment to the surrender process under the European arrest warrant taking its normal course. Could, could they have exercised uh, the right as a member state to say, in this case, we, we have doubts for some other reason? Well, theoretically, yes. I mean, there's. I mean, there, there, there is. I mean, there's a limited number of there's a, lim, there's a limited number of uh, bases for for challenge or non-recognition of a European arrest warrant. Right. But at the end of the day, you know, it's always open to someone to try and and, and develop an argument that that it's, ha it's, ha it's a bit of an imponderable. But you know, there's always there's always scope for for um, for developing it. But it's not something we've encountered up until now. And certainly, in terms of this in terms of this case, it's very much been Brexit that has that has been posited. As the uh, or as the problem here. Okay, Liam, you wanted to yeah, comment. Yeah, follow that up because um, I mean I think what Leandro was saying earlier on was that while there are grounds for uh, for, for challenge, actually the time frames and one of the benefits of the, uh, the European arrest warrant process has been the strict time limits yeah. and the way that they're applied. I mean I'm struggling to see how um, a, a grounds for, for for challenge could be based around. A Brexit process, um, rather than the the issues that are material to that specific case, and that may ultimately prove to be the case. But that, but you know, the problem is where we are just now is is that where we are just now is that someone has put has has put forward a challenge that the um, Irish courts have been prepared to entertain to a certain extent thus far, but are saying, but we want to refer that on to the CGEU for sort of final determination, and it may be that. 
it may be that the CGAU says no. The, the, law, the law just now is, is that the EEW is in force and the UK is part of the EU and therefore these time limits and whatever should apply, but we're just not there. And it's, it's, I suppose it's just something that's come in from the left field that we had necessarily anticipated. I suppose that's the problem. It's a moving feast, isn't it? <laughs> and Mary? One thing that strikes me looking at all this, I mean, <clears throat> obviously all these uh, different uh, matters that we're involved in, we want to be able to continue in these post-Brexit as well. And I think looking at it beforehand, you know, it's it's like we've pick, picked and chosen what we want to be part of anyway through the opt-ins and the opt-outs. So essentially we're kind of looking to do the same thing, except we won't be in the position where we're a member of that organisation where we can pick and choose. And I do, I think I, I just have concerns that given that we will be a third country at some point that obviously... Are they going to look as kindly to the to the pick and choose and uh, opt in and opt outs as, as what we've had uh, before? But I'd really just like to come back to something that Michael Clancy said a bit earlier, and um, it was really in terms of the Law Society, uh, the Law Society of Scotland's submission. Um, and you, you talked about it there that the UK government has indicated its intention to work with the devolved administrations, uh, recognising that Scotland has a, a separate legal system. Do you feel that is something that has been adequately recognised so far? Because again, I feel like that's a, another fear that I have. I think that given the number of times that the GMC's met so far, I think there was a gap of about nine months uh, between meetings last year, that there hasn't been the adequate time to give this, and the Scottish legal system in particular, the attention that it deserves uh, in these negotiations. And I think, uh, I think a question for us here as well is how we ensure that uh, Scotland's voice is heard within all these discussions and negotiations. Well, I think you've already expressed considerable concern about the, the time frame, Michael, but please, please respond. Um, thank you, uh, uh, Convener. It, it, it's an interesting point about uh, um, the extent to which um, issues like the, the Scottish uh, unique uh, system of, of criminal um, uh, justice um, is discussed around the cabinet table. I, I, I wouldn't like to, to venture how many times that has been raised around the cabinet table um, in number 10 Downing Street. Um, I might get it wrong. Um, uh, but I, th I think it is important for us to recognise that uh, discussions between the UK government uh, and the devolved administrations uh, go on at many levels and I have uh, every confidence that officials uh, are um, uh, keeping one another in touch on various aspects um, uh, uh, relating to uh, justice, uh, civil law uh, and, and other elements um, in this. Uh, it might be much more difficult at the point at which uh, ministers uh, are meeting for these issues to be raised uh, onto that agenda. Um, uh, but as I said earlier, I think uh, the underpinning of the rule of law means that all the other things can function. Uh, so that uh, the negotiations about agriculture and, uh, and uh, financial services and uh, company law matters and all of these things, these are all underpinned by the idea that we can go about our business without fear um, uh, uh, of um, not being able to go about our business. Um, so it, this is clearly very important. I think it is in the minds of ministers and I believe that um, uh, UK ministers are aware that there is a distinct nature to the Scottish jurisdiction. Uh, the Lord Advocate's speech in Brussels um, it has been heard uh, by people in Brussels at UCREP and ScotREP. Um, it, uh, the, the Lord Advocate, I'm sure, it has frequent discussions with uh, his UK counterpart, the Advocate General um, uh, for Scotland. Uh, and I know that during the course of uh, the debates in uh, the House of Lords, which are due to start um, uh, to uh, tomorrow, um, uh, in the committee stage of the EUWB, uh, that um, issues around and about the Scottish legal system will be raised because uh, I have made sure that amendments uh, have been prepared, which have been tabled, uh, to, to, uh, to raise these issues. Uh, so, uh, therefore, I, I have no doubt that UK ministers are aware. The difficulty, of course, is uh, that... Um, uh, when it comes to the negotiations, um, uh, there, there, there may be um, uh, in the, the red heat uh, of discussion, if we can describe it like that, um, uh, there might be things which just 
don't get remembered or something like that. That's, that is a possibility. Uh, and, uh, but, but I live in hope. Excellent. Liam, you wanted to say something. Yeah. And I mean, I'd, I'd say this is somebody who's appalled at the prospect of what Brexit holds, uh, by and large. And I think there are um, any number of examples of where um, UK ministers are grossly overestimating the strength of our negotiating position. But it does strike me that this is an area of where there is mutual self-interest. And while one cannot determine what the outcome will look like, actually the political drivers behind this look very different here than they do in, in other areas. I was looking at the, the, um, the, the quote from, um, a, oh, what's his name? Um, uh, Richard Walton, um, the Metropolitan Police Service Counterterrorism Command, who um, suggested that um, there is no way European countries will want us uh, to stop sharing with them uh, and vice versa. They need us as much as we need them. Our security does not depend on engaging with the institutions of the EU. It does depend on collaboration with European countries and that will carry on regardless. Now that maybe overstates the, the, the point to some extent and, and ignores, uh, I think, what Leandro was saying earlier about the view the ECJ may take on this irrespective of what uh, member states uh, may, may themselves see as in their own um, self-interest. But I was just wondering whether, amongst the witnesses here, there is a general sense that that mutual self-interest gives a degree of confidence that whatever emerges from this uh, will be something that um, approximates towards what we've got uh, at the moment, even if it's deficient in, in some areas. Or if that's too, that it, it, it's too early to, to, to say, or, or whether that's grossly over... Can, can I add into the, the mix maybe um, that caution and the, um, the kind of cutting edge work that's done there that I think is internationally recognised and, and how that is maybe something that is a wee bit of a trump card if, if you like in Scotland here um, if, if, if they've got um, data which is um, very much uh, at the cutting edge and, and proceeds uh, or, or processes going on there or work going on there that is helping um, combat terrorism or, or, or various bits of crime. How does that fit into the mix? I wonder if, I think it was the Crown Fockery to Fiscal Service um, submission that mentioned that. So perhaps Lorraine and, um, and Helen would like to, to comment on that. Helen, would you like to, to kick off with that? Well, certainly, um, I, think, uh, I think in terms of put, putting forward what is achievable is one of the things we want to focus on that having from the point of view of, of, of maximizing what you can do with international cooperation be it with the Europe, Europe or more widely um, the the, the uh, way in which we've organized ourselves in Scotland and and the uh, the development of the crime campus are um, are key factors that we can put forward uh, to our advantage in in uh, in shaping any future arrangements um, to, to deal with, 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 with your point, um, Mr. MacArthur, I, I, I'm not. Sh I, I think there's. A, I think there's an alignment across Europe as to the mutual benefit that there undoubtedly is from from um, the justice and security arrangements that are in place just now. But I, I think I, you know, from my own point of view, I feel it's too early to say whether we will confidently deliver those. I think there's an aspiration there, but I think. And I suppose it gets back to the point I was making earlier with the Dublin, Dublin case. Things can come out of the left field that you don't quite anticipate. So I, I quite, can't go so far as to say there's, co that there's confidence, but I think there is a, I think there is a mutual um, uh, aspiration to, to preserve matters as much as possible. So at the moment. And Lorraine? Um, just picking up from where Helen's left off, um, from a policing perspective, um, will we still be able to cooperate with our partners throughout Europe? Um, Yes, will it be as slick and effective as it is at the moment? Probably not if we don't maintain full membership. It will be more time-consuming, cumbersome, bureaucratic and possibly financially constraining um, because the measures are there for to, to cut away all the bureaucracy or a lot of the bureaucracy. Um, with regards to Gart Kosh, um, personal experience um, is probably one of the most efficient areas that I've worked in um, due to the fact you have so many agencies working within the one building um, and it, it is held up internationally. We've had visitors from all over, um, both the UK and EU and further afield, who held it as being um, groundbreaking, so to speak. Um, and the, the EU Commissioner, Julian King, 
has also uh, commented on his recent visit. So, so to address your, your initial point, if the measures are there for a reason, if they're not there, then it's going to be more time consuming. If the political will is there, if both the EU and the UK benefit from this mutual cooperation, then does it come a political priority on both sides? And if it does, would some of these concerns you have then not be concerns? <laughs> Again, it's a crystal ball we're talking about, but I think it is in everybody's benefit for them to um, to maintain this relationship and for it to become political. Anyway, so the world's getting smaller in terrorist terms. Well, not just terrorism, um, local crime that affects me, yeah. you, and our next door neighbours and all the relatives, and that's just as important. Okay, Ben. Given what, what's just been said there, and also what you said earlier, Michael Clancy, about security being. <laughs> The prime, uh, one of the prime responsibilities of government, and, and what's also been said by the Crown, do you, uh, in, in, uh, in a similar way to what the convener just asked, but from a different perspective, do you think that the UK government's evident political approach to these issues of security, in terms of the Munich speech and seeing uh, these as, as, as negotiating positions rather than? Uh, seeking primarily to come to an agreement is is irresponsible and that actually given the, the absolute importance and imperative nature of tackling criminality that politics shouldn't be a, a prevailing factor in this and actually responsible government should be the, the overarching persuasion of politicians. And is that the position? Is it a negotiation or are they seeking agreement? I suppose that would be the key point to... to to, to get views on, <laughs> if there are any, but I'm not sure it's going to take us very much further because <laughs> anyone want to comment on that? Yes, it shouldn't be a negotiation I, I, tool. Yeah. It should be yeah. so of, the of, more is, uh, of, of a heightened yeah. importance than so a than I negotiating suppose it, position. Is it a negotiation or is it trying to seek agreement? Then uh, it may well be a time will tell um, question. If nobody wants to address that. Can I thank you all very much for your attendance today? This is obviously a very complex issue and it's been useful to tease out behind it. You know, there's not just an agreement that we're looking for here. There could be broad brush approach, but many other factors to be looked at underneath. And, and hopefully we've got an idea of the challenges and possibly some, some solutions and areas that we may, may look to. Can I... Um, Thank you all very much for coming and say we will be considering the evidence we've heard today as part of our, our work programme and see where we go from there. But um, you, what you, you said and, and giving us an overview has been very much appreciated. So thank you all very much for attending. Um, we now uh, move into, we're going to suspend briefly just to allow the witnesses to, to leave and then look at agenda item three. Thank you all very much.
Agenda item three is an invitation to members to delegate responsibility to me as convener to arrange for the Scottish Parliament corporate body to pay on request witnesses' expenses for the Brexit and policing and criminal justice evidence session. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. Thank you. Uh, agenda item four is feedback from the Justice Subcommittee on Policing on its meeting of 8th of February 2018. Following the verbal report, there will be an opportunity for brief comments or questions, should members have any. And I refer members to paper three, which is a note by the clerk, and invite John Finney to provide feedback. Thank you, convener. Uh, the Justice uh, Subcommittee on Policing met on the 8th of February. And on that occasion, we took evidence from Her Majesty's Inspectorate of Constabulary in Scotland on their strategic review of undercover policing in Scotland. Um, we took evidence from Michael Matheson, the Cabinet Secretary for Justice, um, um, Derek Penman, the Chief, Her Majesty's Chief Inspector, and Stephen Whitelock, who was the lead inspector on that particular review. Um, we also considered as part of that meeting our work programme and we agreed the following. That was A, to, to keep that uh, under review, the, the, the evidence we'd heard under review, um, about undercover policing, be to write, uh, to, to invite written evidence from the Association of Police Superintendents, Police Scotland, the Scottish Police Federation and Unison Scotland in relation to the ongoing review of Police Scotland has in respect of custody provision. We also um, see uh, was to undertake further work in the financial management and leadership of Police Scotland and the Police Authority. And uh, we agreed to write to the police, uh, sorry, I beg your pardon, the Public Audit and Post Legislative Scrutiny Committee seeking an update on any future work it might have planned in relation to the finance and governance issues relating to Police Scotland and the SPA. And to write, finally, to write to the SPA seeking clarification in relation to issues relating to the SPA board. The subcommittee meet uh, this coming Thursday and we will uh, hold an evidence session on Durban Constabulary's reports on Police Scotland's Counter Corruption Unit. Thank you for that, John. Are there any comments or questions from members? That being the case, thank you very much for that. And we now move into private session. That concludes the public part of the meeting. And our next uh, meeting will be on Tuesday, 27th of February, where our main business will be consideration of stage two of the events of behaviour at Football and Threatening Communications Repeal Scotland Bill and the Civil Litigation Expenses and Group Proceedings um, Scotland Bill also. So now move into private session. <laughs>